Thank you for joining us. I'm Gord Long. It's my pleasure to have back with me today Charles Hugh Smith, well-known and prolific writer on the web, who is the publisher of the website of twominds.com, as well as the author of a library of books. Uh, welcome back, Charles. Thank you, Gordon. It's always my pleasure. This is part two of our two-part discussion on social control. In this session, I'm going to be taking the lead to discuss how the concepts you outlined in part one are now being implemented to show some real world examples many listeners frankly may not be familiar with and the the best and most publicly visible example of this and you mentioned it in part one is the implementation of social control today that can be found in China. In China it is called the um, the social credit system here and I've got a, a display of you know a score which a Chinese citizenship will be given or is getting planned for full implementation by 2020 which is only two years away from now and much of it's been going on as far back as 2004 it's a national system designed to value and engineer better individual behavior by establishing the score of really 1.4 billion citizens and rewarding the trustworthy and punishing the disobedient and this goes right back to what you were talking about in in part one Charles because with this mass of it's too expensive you've got it's got to be an incentive reward system to control 1.4 billion people and it's more than just the media and it's more than just propaganda you got to have a tighter control so that's why they're leading but I think it's it's around the world just in different forms the implementation is already advanced sufficiently that the country's national development and reform commission beautiful um, agency name isn't it Charles yes uh, <laughs> reform commission uh, claims and I know I'm not making this stuff up uh, they claim they've already banned more than seven million people who are deemed untrustworthy from uh, boarding flights and nearly three million others from riding on high-speed trains is, uh, is just an example uh, others have already been banned from staying in star-rated hotels or buying a house taking a holiday or even sending uh, for example children to to certain private schools so dozens of pilot social credit systems have already been tested by the local governments at the provincial and city levels here quite some time now but the credit system uses an overall point system where every resident I don't want to get too detailed but I think it, it, it would really help for people to understand listeners to understand this where every resident is rated on a scale between 0 and 200 points and every resident starts with a baseline of 100 so you can get more points or you're going to get points taken away from you kind of reminds me of our FICA score here in the in the United States right but one can earn bonus points for benevolent acts and lose points for disobeying obviously laws or regulations or social norms whatever they are and how the government determines what they are so for example a top rated citizen if we can call them that would have 134 points given to them as a final score for donating more than one liter of blood and doing more than 500 hours of volunteer work kind of like our prisoners working off their crimes Charles to society but making it positive incentive you lose points and are punished for transgression for example such as and I like some of these dodging transport fares cheating on video games or not showing up at a restaurant where you booked um, uh, reservations and you know Charles frankly that's pretty well standard behavior here in Boston <laughs> so <you> know, <laughs> everybody's gonna be in the negative here but to catch the perpetrators they use facial recognition now to identify them so besides losing points jaywalkers for example are posted online to additionally shame them and I use that because that's another example of what you were referring to but they actually use this terminology shame and it's a form of the control of, of the uh, of the coercion that they use because I guess they're more sensitive to saving face in China and in Asia than than we are. So it's more it's found to be a better co coercive force. And I you know I found the implementation of shaming approach to really be fascinating. And one area where the, the local social credit system, which had started way back in 2004, the authorities reportedly automatically apply messages 
to your mobile phone line if you're a blacklisted citizen. So whoever calls this you, the a lowly rated person by this score, before your call comes through, they get your that they're calling you. They get this message that says this person you're calling is dishonest. Okay, it's almost like a disclaimer, right? The government's not taking responsibility. You're talking to a, a dishonest person. Charles, I really wish I was making this up, but ABC, who reported this, they even seem stunned at how punitive they've now taken it to. And you'll see a lot of this rolled out at the national level. A lot of it's still at the regional and the city levels at various levels of implementation. But some areas of China have already em- employed what is known as, and I got a name for it, the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. And it's showing here as a, as a diagram of collecting data uh, called the IJOP. And it's a high-tech mass surveillance system that pools information on citizens' bank records, computer details, and their legal past. Not too dissimilar to what we already have but it's how they use it. Reportedly runs in parallel to their current social credit system and gathers its information from multiple sources or sensor devices. And I thought this was interesting too because one source, and I'm showing a picture here of these cameras, one source is is cameras. When we, we know video cameras are everywhere today, but some of theirs have already have built-in facial recognition and night infrared uh, capabilities into these cameras. You can see how really sophisticated the point of entry is, never mind the computers that are behind it. And another source is what the Chinese term uh, Wi-Fi sniffers, which pool the unique identifying addresses of computers, smartphones, and other network devices. That doesn't seem that, that complicated, but what you have is a combination of these Wi-Fi sniffers, night vision, and big data, which is allowing them to do all sorts of very, very creative things. This iJob gathers information including license plate numbers and citizen identification card numbers from security checkpoints. Um, for example, where police or security personnel have special glasses, as is shown here on this particular slide. These glasses bring up information in real time and display it in their lens, ever mind the information that they in turn can send back to the main main site verbally. And you can see this in the top right corner, I don't know how clearly it comes up here, of this corner insert of what they're seeing being displayed as they're looking around. And they monitor and do surveillance of people and particular categories of people who the authorities consider as what they call focus personnel. And that could be people with, and I hate to say this, but mental disabilities or with mental health problems because they see that they're potential terrorists or people who have complained to the government. God, everybody in the United States would be on this list. Petitioners, minorities, and so on. The IJOP also sends a list of the people deemed suspicious whatever that is, to the police formally, and they are then detained for investigation. The social credit system may only result in maybe small punishments and warrants, possibly because it's minor infractions, but it disciplines people. And it disciplines them in a number of ways. They almost is like your example in part one of the trained rats and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, of how we will react to uh, certain things. They're getting it down to a real fine art form in China. Any comments so far, Charles? Yeah, just two um, uh, real quick, which is, um, you know, so many aspects of this can be sold as a positive, right? In other words, wouldn't wouldn't you like to know whether the person you're about to interact with is a, is is um, dishonest or, or untrustworthy. And of course, we'd, we'd say, well, yeah, sure. If we know that it would be wonderful to, to find out if that person cheated nine out of the last 10 people they interacted with, because then we could avoid um, you know, the problem. And wouldn't it be nice if people who um, are bad citizens who smoke in non-smoking zones and, um, uh, and uh, do all those other uh, bad citizen behavior if if um if they could be punished by some um you know super uh organization of the government then we'd go well that'd be great because then all those bad behaviors will will decline because there's there now people are being punished and so there's a there's a certain positive uh element to this that that i think is part of how it's being sold to the populace in other words this is for everybody's benefit. It has to be sold. I mean, there has to be benefits for something to be sold initially before it really starts to take control. And not necessarily that they have a master plan that it's going to be bad, but it just seems to always evolve that way. It's been my experience. And something that starts good gets quickly distorted for various reasons.
you know, so so everybody can fully appreciate Charles, the, the level of sophistication that's already going on in China for them to handle, you know, 1.4 billion people, as I said earlier. Look at the detail displayed here in this um, in this graphic. There's a street here where you've got buses, cars, motorcycles, people, um, bicycles, all moving in real time. And you'll notice beside every single one of them is a little box, which is identifying who they are, what they are. What, information that is pre prevalent, where they're going, potentially where they're coming from, where they're going to. So that that is working. That's that's there right now. And and, um, and hopefully you get a sense from this, you know, the, the, the magnitude and what can be done with it. This this is really frightening. And uh, but they have a reason for doing it. Remember, it was part of your example, Charles, earlier, you know, I got two different types of governments. And, uh, you know, the, the, when you got that kind of control through the Communist Party, you can be more effective in, in the coercion part of it, et cetera. But how do you do it on, the, on an open democratic society? But don't for one moment think that it's not already happening here or in a different form or is emerging in a different form. So let's, um, Charles, if you don't have any other questions, let me, let me switch gears then. Yeah. Okay, let, let, so let's consider the fact that China and think about this, has never been a technology leader and certainly is not known as a center for innovation after going through what we just went through. So the question it begs is, who developed all this technology that they're using? You know, certainly to some degree the Chinese, no doubt, but I su suspect the real answer is the U.S. Silicon Valley, and I'll use that figuratively. Again, maybe minimally for some, but maybe maybe all of it I, I don't I don't know we won't know for sure but this takes us to Western society and the best way to explore that is always to simply follow the money this almost always leads to the government and in the Silicon Valley in terms of technology and major tech firms of the last half century have been consistently associated in one way or another with the military industrial security complex this includes Oracle, this includes Google, and most major players. You know, Google with its long admitted relationship with the NSA was part of how it was founded, what it was doing. And let's not forget Facebook with its you know, ties to the um, NQTEL, uh, which is the CIA's uh, venture capital arm. So I'm not trying to cast aspersions here. I'm just trying to say that the technology leadership has always come out of the government in the United States uh, as a as a driving force, uh, certainly not, not not exclusively, but it does dominate it. And you know, and I read recently how the CIA wants to spy on you through even a dishwasher. And you know, as absurd as that, but it was well documented. And I have the link here. And how smart TVs can be used as audio listening devices, or how video surveillance cameras are now being networked. There's just a steady stream of this sort of thing appearing in the media and certainly on the web. But it's actually all around us. If rather than reading about it, if you just pay attention. For example: My family watches the TV series Blue Blood which prides itself on the reality of the New York City police operations. And it's frankly not prone to exaggeration or sensationalism. But it showed in its latest episode the use of subway scanners and facial recognition to capture illegal activity in real world, real, real time example. And they, they, what they showed was an officer chasing a criminal on foot and the criminal who fled into the New York subway system. So the officer, via uh, their mobile radio, they called in the suspect and they ID'd them, which brought up, uh, they're able to bring up their photo from their driver's license, which was then passed to the subway system, which went into their system, their surveillance. They were able to locate and track uh, through the subway surveillance system the movement of that person, including when they exited the subway and being able to get the taxi cab plate number from the surveillance cameras in real time and then had a po local police cruiser stop the taxi and make the arrest this is not a fictional movie they were this is they were showing this working and in real life and i just don't know how many people really realize the level of sophistication that's already there i guess unless you're a criminal and you're suddenly caught and you say you know what what happens but the recent congressional hearings and testimony 
regarding Facebook has brought a lot more visibility to what is going on. You know, ever mind all the publicity the NSA has been getting and other agencies, you know, since uh, Edward Snowden blew the blew the whistle here. God, it's going back three or four years or longer now. But, you know, and watch, for example, Charles, the, the new movie on Edward Snowden, uh, who now hiding in Russia, helped put it, put it together, to see the degree to which information tracking is already in place throughout the Western nations. And, you know, some former Facebook senior executives stated, you know, and I'll quote, these are a couple of their quotes, the quote, the short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops we've created are destroying how society works. It reminds me of when they blew the whistle on the cigarette manufacturers who were referring to it as a cigarette as a nicotine delivery vehicle. That's the thinking that this executive who was the former president before they really passed the strings completely to Mark Zuckerman in the early days. And he also said that he won't even let his children use Facebook because of what's going on. And at the net of this, Charles, is there something called gaming theory for those who've studied that in, in, in university. And they're using techniques of gaming theory as incentives to really capture. And you can see that with the kids who are captured by social media. And how do you do it? Well, the incentive is to have more friends. That's a status, right? The status is to get more of your stuff, get signaled as a likes. It's your, yeah, that's just another level of status. There's more status if something you have is then sent on or forwarded. So all of these reward systems are now built into your social recognition and your status. And we kind of all know that and suspect, suspect it. But, it, but it's now a science that the, everybody that it's being taken to. And this is, a, as you can see from this slide, it says it's a multi-billion dollar industry, this personal data ecosystem. But I frankly think it's going to be a, it's an emerging trillion dollar sector. And I mentioned this earlier in part one about apps. Clearly, everybody uses many of them, but few are not free. I mean, how many how many times, Charles, have you ever paid for an app? Have you ever paid for an app? Pretty rare, right? Right. Exactly. So they're free. So how do these corporations make money if what they're doing is free? What are they doing? Why are they being so nice to us, just giving this incredibly sophisticated kind of work? How do we make money? We, do we ever ask that question? And we suspect the answer. But have you ever read the small print on the terms you agreed to before you downloaded it? I did the other day, intentionally. I've done it before. But this one, I really took it seriously. And it scared the hell out of me. I, I, I knew it was knew what it was taking but they own everything they can do anything on that device even what you say is now in their domain and it can be transcripted from voice transcription etc and used and passed on and sold we kind of know that and we say who gave them the right we gave them the right they have every legal right to do it because we were in a hurry and we just clicked it or we needed the app and we couldn't get along without it so the info is being captured everywhere but the misunderstood element is how it's being made useful and for what purpose. That's what people suspect and smell but really don't see it. And this slide here kind of shows you the corporations that are now involved. And this is an sampling that are not government, but corporations that are now taking that information and really aggregating it. And we, you know, we just saw an example of how it's used in China. But in the U.S., it's likely this and much more because the more... Uh, the more being corporate commercial applications where it's used for new information and knowledge products, competitive advantage, um, mass target advertising and marketing, uh, the marketing market, and a raft of other uses. Big, well-recognizable corporations in the private space make a living gathering and sharing this information. And you can be assured one of the big users is the government. And it will be in an increasing fashion. And like everything with the government, I said earlier, starts small for possibly good reasons, but eventually becomes huge and is abused for political reasons. And I think you can verify that from history. This chart here of this man, but just shows you some of the examples of where that information is being consolidated and being used. And it's just a sampling. This is the level of detail available on any one of us in the developed world basically which can be commercially obtained and bought if you have some use for it you can be assured this will lead to further and rapid advances in social control in the United States and the Western developed economies that we don't even know about or won't know about on maybe until it's too late anything you want to add there Charles to any of this 
Yeah, I'd like to add a couple of comments. One is that um, one of the uh, important elements that uh, Snowden's uh, revelations revealed to the, the public was the, the tremendous level of misdirection in this informa information uh, universe. A in other words, um, the CIA has all sorts of programs which insert um, little, little tracking uh, bits of code that make it look like it originated in Russia. So, in other words, that that's where this this whole uh, narrative of of Russian hacking, the, it's like uh, going down the rabbit hole because um, we now know that the CIA uh, makes uh, uh, sniffing programs and so on, hacking hacking programs, makes them appear to have originated in Eastern Europe or, or Russia. When in actual fact, they're they're a, a U.S. government agency um, device, and so, and the same level of misdirection we're we're getting here in the Facebook thing, you know, like that Facebook says, oh no, you know, you control everything um, f that 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 uh, Facebook uh, gathers and and shares, and then of course that's that's just simply not true. But my point here is, there's so much misdirection and confusion on um, to uh, lull us into. Uh, believing that it's all okay, um, that it's very hard to sort out, uh, right? I mean, that's it's very hard to sort, sort out what's being collected, who's collecting it, and who has access to it. In fact, I, I'm not even sure it's possible to, to really unravel that, um, uh, that uh, ball of thread. Charles, yeah. I've tried to yeah. as an investor looking for investment opportunities because I happen to think this is one of the growth sectors uh, that's going to emerge in a massive way. At who's the leading part of it? And I went at it initially through facial uh, recognition uh, software and everything else. And I can tell you, it's a bear because they all stay well below the surface. Ability is not what they look for. And it's not that they're devious or anything else. They're just, it's where they're, how they see their market and, and um, who's searching them out. It's very, very hard to find that information. Whereas most technology, when it breaks, it's on the public domain, and we're all looking at it, and that's how things would grow, right? No, it all it's all it's all below the surface. It's was stunning to me who's been a, somebody who had been in venture capital. That's an excellent point. My last point was just that um, you know, in the bad old days of illegal surveillance by the um, FBI and CIA, which was the late '60s and early '70s, when um, the um, these uh, the security agencies were tasked with um, undermining. Um, uh, the groups of, of dissent, like the anti-war movement and um, the civil rights movement. And so they, there was a lot of illegal surveillance done. Um, and this came out in the early 70s. And, and this included um, illegal wiretaps, um, illegal burglaries, all, all sorts of illegal activities. Well, what we're talking about now is all these agencies need to do is just um, buy this stuff from um, Google, Facebook, at etc., et, uh, et and and they don't even need to um, go in and, and and do an illegal wiretap. <laughs> they can get everything they need on on our, on everybody from um, as you say from the material that we have given our legal approval to share. And it's and how do you get around that though? In other words, do you do you stop using a bank? Do you stop using the internet? Do you stop using social media? Do you stop using a, a mobile phone? Um, and so it's we're really in a, a no man's or no person's land here, where it's very hard to say I'm gonna I'm gonna de um, I'm gonna get out of this, I'm gonna completely get out of this um, this system. And it's all like, oh really? How? Presently, now at the stage where it's extremely difficult, we're very quickly going to be where it's impossible even if you choose to, where you can't function without the system. Think of, for an example, if we go to a cashless society and get rid of money, it's completely lost control. That's really where the where social control is happening, where we've relinquished it, and we will have no, will be no turning back, and we won't have shackles on it. There won't be chains. We are changed. We've surrendered our options, as I said earlier. We're the ones that are guilty. We just don't know we're surrendering them. We're right. Because it's like the Second World War, as the Jews were boarding the, the trains going to Auschwitz, they weren't being told where they were going. They were going to settling camps, right? So what you're told may be not exactly what's going to unfold on this, this trip. And you can almost be assured of it. I'm not trying to be, be negative here. Many of our forefathers died to give us this ability to make these choices. And if we're squandering them, we need to, to be terrified of it. Charles, I'll leave uh, uh, our, our 
listeners with one thought here as we as, as we close and you we've talked about many times if in fact we have a debt saturation levels if our society starts to break down because of financial and economic issues and there's a lot of indications of, of a lot of that how do how without things turning into anarchy how do you control it how do you manage it well you say we have to have police well we've said you know the difference between force and power there's there's got to be a better way or a more effective way to some degree to controlling that anarchy that can surge and that's what china is afraid of they they know that their biggest issue isn't making profits for example their job is employment if they don't have employment for people the communist party is is it will be gone so they know that they have to control that and if they think there's a slowdown and people are going to be unemployed how are they going to handle that that's what's going on today i believe and i believe well, quite strongly on that no it's not it's not uh, it's very much on track uh, gordon because um, my final comment will be the the government and the people that work in the government feel that they're doing the right thing yes in in in, in just as you say in developing ways to counter uh, social disorder. Well, these are people trying to do the right things, what they perceive for the right reasons, so that it's better for everybody. For, for everybody, that's how it always starts. It never ends up that way. Right. That's it. We're talking about where does it go, despite the um, the uh, good intentions. And of course, we all know the road to heck is paved with good intentions. And when things get tough, there's less and less, and rationing has to happen, and people have to be controlled. That's when these systems will be used for evil intentions that may not have been planned on before. And the time to stop this is now, not then, because it, and we're right on the cusp where I don't even know if it is any longer stoppable. Because I don't even sure that we politically can catalyze enough people um, to get because we're so polarized as as groups today to get a consensus to stop it. Right. Uh, and I, and we don't have the media and we and the media itself is is control. I'm not trying to be talk conspiratorial here. I think it's a true major legitimate social problem today that gets zero visibility, little discussion. And, and as blatant as this two-part series has pointed it out, I think everybody may suspect it, but the, I, I can assure you that 9 out of 10 people would just roll their eyes and poo-poo uh, what we just talked about if we were in a cocktail party and then quietly move on because uh, you're just a weird guy. Right. right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true, too. But anyway, Charles, we have to break way past. Great, great uh, subject area. Too much to talk about here. Um, last comments? Nope, just visit me at of2minds.com. And um, thank you very much for this topic, Gordon. And we'll have another exciting one next month. Talk to you then, Charles. Okay.